So selection and extraction. So again, common error we see here is that people people are generally aware that two people should be working independently to uh, screen the studies that they find in the search and decide which studies will be included in the review. Um, a common error that we see sometimes being made is people who say one person um, screened the titles and the abstracts and two people screened the full text. I'm afraid that's not acceptable. We we do need you do need two people working independently right from the start, um, <clears throat> just to ensure that um, every potential study is being considered, and to minimise the amount of potential bias in your decision making process. Um, it's important also to to um, decide in advance what you're going to do when the two people who are screening this, um, the studies disagree and that will happen. There will be some studies that one person says this definitely fits and another person says no I disagree, I don't think this study is exactly what we're looking for and you need to decide in advance exactly how you're going to resolve that process. Um, again just to reiterate once again how important it is to include studies in the review regardless of whether they have measured data in a way that you consider usable. Um, and again, um, it's also important to try to make an effort to seek unpublished information that is missing from the reports. So there will be many times you'll read a report and you know the report might say this is a randomized trial and you're not 100% sure is it a true randomized trial, does it really fit the design features I'm interested in and in those cases you will have to contact the author and ask them could you please tell me more about your design process just to ensure that the study really does fit your eligibility criteria. Um, so this, this is a very common sort of statement we'll see in the selection of study section. Review authors will independently review um, and assess. Um, and you'll see two things missing here. First of all, review authors, that's quite ambiguous. Um, you know, they don't really clarify, you know, do they really mean two, two authors or do they mean review authors in general will be doing it separately. Um, so really the best way to improve that sort of section is first of all to put in very specifically two review authors and afterwards insert in brackets the exact two review authors who you have decided are going to be doing the screening process. So in this situation it was myself, NL and my colleague JH. Um, and also we needed to insert a statement at the end about what to do if there's a disagreement. So just to clarify that when we do disagree, the full review team will discuss the decision um, because there were three people in our review team. So um, the third uh, member of the team was really there to act as an arbiter whenever the two of us couldn't decide. Uh, risk of bias, now this is a very tricky one as well. Um, again, two people should be working independently when doing the risk of bias assessments. It's not enough for one person to do the risk of bias assessment and another person to look at what they've done and say, yes, that's fine. Ideally, the two people should go away and do it separately and then come back and compare the results and see any areas where they disagreed and discuss, well, why did you think high low when I thought low? Uh, high risk when I thought low risk and try and identify what the problem is and what is the what is the solution. It's really important that every decision that is made in a risk of bias assessment is justified. Um, so it's not enough to say uh, the risk of bias for sequence generation was unclear and leave it at that. You need to be very specific. It was unclear because all they said in the paper was participants were randomized and did not provide any more detail than that. Um, you should also be consider whether it's appropriate to look at key risk of bias domains separately for different key outcomes. Um, so for example, an outcome like, um, like cognitive function, um, it might, you know, if someone knows that they're, sorry, not cognitive function, uh, depression. If you think of an outcome like depression and a person is not blinded, so they know that they have been receiving an intervention that is meant to treat depression, there is a good chance that that will, you know, that will affect their their outcome. They could um, experience a placebo effect and think that they, their depression has improved just because they know they have received the intervention. So in a case like that, a domain like blinding is very important. But if you think about the outcome of death, um, if a person 
person knows that they have received the treatment, that is not going to make them any more or less likely to die. Um, so an outcome such as death, maybe the domain um, of blinding isn't quite as important. So, you know, it's different, it's, you know, it could be important to think about the, it could be important to assess those outcomes differently for that domain. Um, I would really recommend that you ensure you have a really good understanding of the domains before you start to do the risk of bias assessment. And the best way to do this is in the protocol, give as much detail as possible about each of the domains and describe, you know, what is what will you consider to be a high risk of allocation concealment, what will you consider to be low risk, you know, just give a few examples of exactly how you're going to make each decision. Um, because the, the two most common errors we do see in reviews are people who confuse allocation concealment for blinding and people who confuse incomplete outcome data for selective outcome reporting. I'm going to go on to that in a minute. Um, oh, I would also recommend you consider drafting an empty shell table at the protocol stage uh, to then be populated during the review process. Um, so for example, a table like this, very easy to make, and just by planning this sort of table in advance, it gives you a good idea of you know, how important it might be to maybe think about um, assessing blinding of, blinding of outcome assessment twice, blinding it once um, for investigator assessed outcomes, and blinding it and assessing it a second time for self-report outcomes, because obviously there will be a difference there. Um, same thing again, perhaps investigator assessed outcomes, there might be um, a lower risk of incomplete outcome data than there is for self-reported outcomes, so it could be important to assess those, two, those domains separately. So it's important to just think about the domains in advance, think about exactly how applicable each domain is for your Cochrane review, and maybe even draft the shell table right at the protocol stage, just to demonstrate that you have thought these issues through and you're prepared. Uh, now I'm going to do another quick poll question. Um, so this time I want to know if you saw a study that stated participants were blinded to group allocation, would you think that is a way in which to assess allocation concealment or blinding of participants? So, Okay, I think we have most of people voted. Okay, oh, interesting. Oh. So, oh, yes, so, so let 40 me just, just mm -hmm. share and let me mm -hmm. close the poll and share it. Yeah, we can see the results. Okay, now. that's great. So, 40% think that that is a way to measure allocation concealment. And 60% think that that is a way to assess blinding of participants. Um, a statement like that is actually only relevant to blinding of participants. Sorry, that's <laughs> um, my yellow box is incorrect. <laughs> Let me just get rid of that. Um, yes, um, if a study states that participants were blinded to group allocation, that's I know it's confusing because the domain is called allocation concealment, but allocation concealment is not about were participants blinded to their allocation? It's about was the process of randomization blinded to the person who allocated the participants to their groups? I know it's confusing, but this just, you know, the 40% the of you who said allocation concealment, you're not alone. And I have seen this error made an awful lot of times in Cochrane reviews, and I do blame the domain because it is, confu it is a confusing name for a domain. But allocation concealment, it's not about concealment of the participants, it's about concealment of the randomization process. So the fact that participants were blinded to their allocation, that a statement like that would be used to assess blinding of participants. A statement that said um, participants, uh, the randomization procedure was concealed using um, 
uh, using opaque brown envelopes. That is a way to measure allocation concealment. So again, it's very easily done. It's, it's a very easy mistake to make, but I would just recommend that you look at the risk of bias domains very carefully in the Cochrane Handbook and make sure you have a very clear understanding of how to assess, assess each one before you write your risk of bias section in your protocol. <coughs> Again, um, so another quick poll here. So this time, um, if a study collects pain data but fails to report it, review authors can use this information to assess incomplete outcome data or selective outcome reporting. So um, do you all, all want to have a go at that then? Okay, perhaps we can close the poll now okay. and share the results. <clears throat> okay, so 21% thought that it was a way to assess incomplete outcome data and 79% thought it was a way to assess selective outcome reporting. So the 79% are right. This is a way of assessing selective outcome reporting. Again, this is very, it's tricky because they are very similar and the, the names of the domains are very similar, but incomplete outcome data is more about um, participants who withdraw or, you know, perhaps a study um, has, uh, you know, maybe a study has removed a few participants from the analysis to improve the scores altogether. You know, especially if you if you do an analysis and there's an outlier, it's always very tempting to just remove that participant just to remove the outlier. So any any examples of those, you know, any times when you think that might have happened, that's an example of when you're assessing incomplete outcome data. So that's when you're looking at participants, um, you know, participant withdrawal, participant attrition, things like that. Where selective outcome reporting is more about what the what the study authors have chose to report in terms of the outcome as a whole. So the fact that they collected the pain data for all of their participants but haven't reported it at all, that suggests that maybe the overall the result for pain data wasn't what they were hoping it would be. So they've decided not to publish it. Um, and that is an example of they have selected outcomes to not report. So that is why that is <clears throat> That's why a statement like that would be assess, used, used to assess selective outcome reporting. Again, the 21%, you're not alone. This is a mistake that is made very, very frequently in many, many Cochrane reviews. So again, it's just it's just a reminder, just you know, to take a good look at the risk of bias domains. And you know, think about all of these issues and make sure you're prepared for them and ready to plan for them when you're writing your protocol. <clears throat> um, measures of treatment effect. Um, so really all that's, all that's necessary here is just to make sure you have a clear plan to undertake or at the very least display a meta-analysis only when your participants, interventions, comparisons and outcomes are judged sufficiently similar to ensure that the answer is clinically meaningful. Um, so you may include studies, when it comes to your full review, you may decide actually the participants are just too different, There's the, you know, these studies are looking at interventions but the interventions are not really similar enough, I don't think it's clinically meaningful to combine this in a meta-analysis and that's absolutely acceptable, you can do a narrative synthesis instead but just as long as you have planned for it in advance that you will only combine the, the data in an analysis if it's going to be clinically meaningful. Um, and a really important thing to remember, and this is an, again something, a common error we see very frequently in a protocol, is ensure that the planned effect measures match your outcomes of interest, specifically time to event data. So this is a very common thing we see, 
Um, so the secondary outcomes in my review, we had care stress, we had institutional or home care, death and treatment adherence. And measured treatment effect, we planned for dichotomous data and we planned for continuous data. And this is very common, most reviews will do this and then leave it at that point. Um, but every review you need to consider, what, are there any other potential types of data that could be produced if I'm searching for these outcomes? Specifically, time to event data. And chances are, there is a chance that I could collect some time to event data if these are the outcomes I'm interested in. Specifically, institutional home care, um, including social care placement breakdown. It's very likely that maybe the, the administrative data that I collect for this outcome is um, how long, what um, time to placement breakdown, you know, how long it took between taking the intervention um, and uh, the social care placement actually breaking down, what was the length of time, um, or death. You know, death is often measured as a dichotomous outcome data, you know, either they died or they didn't die, but sometimes it's measured as time to event data, so, you know, how long before they died. Um, so, it's always important to make, to consider your outcomes very carefully and think, you know, is there any chance that time to event data could be collected for these outcomes, and if so, what will the measures of treatment effect be in that case, you know, and just to clarify, time to event data will be converted into hazard ratios. Um, assessment of heterogeneity, um, again, very, very common error we see, people who try to use thresholds to diagnose heterogeneity, um, and we really, we, we do not encourage this. Um, the I squared, you know, people will use the I squared by itself, or the tau squared by itself, um, and they'll say things like, um, if I study, um, in fact, I have it here, yes, um, if the I square measure of heterogeneity exceeds 40%, a random effects model will be used. We see this all the time and we do not encourage it. Um, the I squared measure, it's, it's not always reliable. Um, there is uncertainty associated with. The I squared measure by itself doesn't even tell you that much. When you're looking at heterogeneity, it's more than just one number. It's about considering the evidence as a whole, considering all of the information that you have in front of you. Um, so really what we recommend is rather than saying we'll decide later whether to use fixed effect or random effect depending on what the I squared says, we encourage you to think now, okay, well you know the evidence base, this is your content area, so you should know in advance whether the evidence base is likely to be, whether there's likely to be a lot of heterogeneity in the evidence base. Um, so for example, in my case, thinking about the evidence base, I think about the participants. And I think about the fact that there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in the participants I'm interested in. I mean, yes, they're all participants with Down syndrome um, who haven't yet got a diagnosis of dementia, but there's a lot of heterogeneity there. There could be, you know, there's going to be males and females, there's going to be different levels of cognitive function, and there's going to be different comorbidities. You know, a lot of people with Down syndrome do have a great deal of comorbidities with other conditions. So I know in advance that there will be heterogeneity in my evidence base, therefore I know in advance random effects model is more than likely going to be needed. So we really encourage you to not use thresholds like this and instead think about your own content expertise and use that to decide in advance. So you know, to state we will account for the expected heterogeneity because we do expect it by using a random effects meta-analysis.